The fires on earth will someday burn out. The flaming sun and all the stars of the universe will someday spend their fuel. But the flame of hell will continue. Revelation 20, verse 10, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. There will be no rest for those who did not believe in Christ and bow the knee to him. Lazarus reclines in Abraham's bosom and enjoys the fellowship and blessings of heaven. But the rich man lifts up his eyes in agony and he seeks relief from his suffering. The flame results in a great desire for water to cool his tongue. Here we see the great contrast between the rich man's life on earth and his state in the afterlife. During his life, he lived in luxury. <clears throat> there was no luxury, pleasure, or fun activity that was denied him. Anything he wanted, he could have. If he wanted a cup of cool water or a glass of fine wine, he would simply snap his fingers and his servants would come immediately to serve him. But in hell, he begs for a cup of water and does not receive one drop. Not one drop. Those who do not believe in Jesus Christ <clears throat> and repent will have no mitigation of their suffering in hell. The rich man who showed no mercy to, to Lazarus while on earth will receive not a drop of mercy from God in the afterlife. And one of the things that makes hell so horrible is the punishment of loss. <clears throat> all the blessings of life that we enjoy, all the good things that people enjoy are gone forever. The handsome face and body that the rich man pampered and worshipped is now food for the worms and will only be resurrected to be cast into the lake of fire at the end of history. His beautiful estate, his glorious mansion, exquisite wardrobe, expensive delicacies, and fun parties, they're gone forever! Unbroken luxury has given way to unbroken loss and anguish. Hell is going to be an especially drastic change for the rich and the famous who are used to driving around in luxurious automobiles and being pampered by servants. The person who is a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God, 2 Timothy 3, 4, whose God is his belly, Philippians 3, 19, will gnash his teeth as he longs for the pleasures that he once had that were a normal part of life. And Jesus warns us to think of such an ignoble end. Excuse me, James does. James 1, 9 to 11. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as the flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower fails and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Rich man will, all rich men will die. And if they do not know Christ, they're going to go to hell, just like everybody else. <clears throat> and this is something that you need to think about. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you are still living for self, if your life rotates around your pleasures and serving self instead of Christ, think about this. The life of the Christian involves self-denial in this world. But what is that compared to the vast eternity? that lies ahead. Yeah, if, let's say you live to be 110 years old. Well, think of the people that live before the flood. They've been dead for thousands of years now. And you'll be dead for millions and millions of years. It will not end. Or in other words, what value do you place on your own soul? And Jesus, Jesus put this whole issue into proper perspective when he said this. 
And this is from <clears throat> Mark 8, 34 to 38. Listen carefully to what he says. Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father with the holy angels. You have to give your life over to Christ. You have to be willing to literally put your life to death and not live for self and live for Christ. The rich man learned after he died it was too late. That his whole worldview and way of thinking was totally wrong. He thought that to value his own soul meant to worship himself and live for one's own enjoyment. But the only way to truly value our soul is to give it over to Christ and his kingdom. And forget about the world's sinful pleasures. Deny yourself. You can forget about Jesus and go with the crowd and do a life of hedonism and sin. And that certainly is the American way today. That is the popular, accepted thing to do in our culture. Christians are looked upon as idiots and fools and morons. But if you do, I want you to know that your worldly fun is going to be short-lived. And then you will suffer the punishment of loss. Hell is not for picnics or dinner parties or fun and games, but for torment. Now, you may indeed have a good time in your short life, but there will be no pleasures for you in hell. No vacations, no walks on the beach, no nights in the town, no alcoholic beverages, no drugs, no cigarettes, no television or movies. No sporting events, no sunsets, no cruises to the Caribbean, no walks to the beach, no companionship or friendly conversation. But instead, hell will give you fire, darkness, torment, anguish, and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Your choice is to believe in Christ now and repent and deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him and have a eternity of bliss in heaven, or you can live for self, you can go with the crowd, you can reject Christ, you can uh, mock the Bible, and spend eternity in hell. That's your choice. And then third, <clears throat> one of the things that makes hell so horrible is that one's consciousness, identity, and memory remains intact. Okay, this passage is very clear about that. After the rich man begged for a bit of water, Abraham said, Son, remember, remember that in your lifetime you enjoyed your good things and likewise Lazarus' evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. Verse 25. The rich man is fully aware <clears throat> of who he is. The fact that his existence on earth is over, he's aware of that. And he can remember what his life was like before he died and went to hell. Okay, he has full consciousness of who he is, who he was, what his life was like, what earth was like. All these things are evident. Abraham politely and gently tells the rich man to think about his life on earth. So that he can fully understand why he is suffering in hell. and why it cannot be alleviated, even for a moment. You need to face justice. It is as if Abraham says, Remember, while you lived on earth, you were exceptionally rich, and Lazarus was the poorest of the poor. He was at your gate suffering horribly, and you were so unbelieving, wicked, and selfish, you left him to die alone in his misery. 
because of your unbelief and your lifestyle that flowed from it. It is your time to suffer torment. And in hell, no one can help you. No one can come to your aid. You are receiving your just recompense of reward. You're receiving justice. That's all hell is. Hell is justice for a life without Christ, a life of sin, a life of rejecting God, a life of spitting on God's law. Hell is justice. God is a righteous, holy, and just God. Hell reflects his nature and character. You see, hell would not make any sense unless the people who go there have an understanding of why they are there. <clears throat> One of the greatest terrors of hell is the sense of regret at having wasted all opportunities to obtain eternal life before it was too late. The consciousness of a deserved eternal retribution of a life lived so carelessly when it came to one's eternal state. Of a life <clears throat> of the obstinate refusal to believe in Christ or study his word. Of the mocking of God's law and the gospel. All of it will make hell a place of eternal regret and despair. Americans know about the Bible. Most Americans have a, a rudimentary knowledge of the gospel. Most Americans know uh, uh, about Jesus Christ and the resurrection and all these things. And they don't care. They don't care about the Sabbath. They don't care about the law of God. They don't care about these things. They're having too much fun. Living for self. Acting like the rich man. And then someday they're going to die. And someday they're going to be in hell. And they're going to think about their life on earth. And, oh, why didn't I do something to avoid this place? Why didn't I go to church and hear the gospel? Why didn't I attend to the means of grace? Why didn't I pray? Why didn't I go to church? Why didn't I repent? Those who are sent to the pit of the abyss at death will see and know and understand a hundred things to which they were obstinately blind while they were alive. And they will discover that like Esau, they have bartered away eternal happiness for a mere mess of pottage. There is no infidelity or skepticism or unbelief after death. There are no atheists in hell. There are no agnostics in hell. There are no Muslims in hell. There are no Hindus in hell. Everybody knows the truth, but it's too late. And that's part of the suffering. Part of the suffering. Everyone in hell will have a fundamental knowledge of the truth, but it will be too late to do them any good. Therefore, it will only serve to sharpen their torment because they will understand that their eternal state is their own fault. They have no one to blame but themselves. If you reject Jesus Christ in the gospel, if you treat Jesus Christ as unimportant, then your refusal to repent and believe is going to torment you throughout eternity. And if you're listening to this sermon, you'll think about this, and you're going to laugh. That guy's a demented fool. How could anyone talk about hell? How could anyone believe in such a doctrine? Well, when you're in hell, it's going to torment you that you did not repent of these words. You will constantly be tortured in mind by the question, what if? Why didn't I do something? Why did he regard Christ as unimportant? And then fourth, the suffering in hell is aggravated by the fact that escape from it is impossible. <clears throat> After Abraham points out that the rich man is receiving his just due, he also knows that a great chasm separates those in hell from those in heaven. There can be no hope of deliverance from the place of darkness for those who die in sin. The verb here is fixed. The verb is fixed is a perfect passive, indicating that God established the great chasm. And the, the Greek word is chasmo. It's where we get the word chasm, meaning a giant gulf, a giant valley. Men 